It's what I used to call football weather right here, buddy. <laughs> we get fired up for football season in this weather, man. Uh, Yes, indeed. All right, but we're not playing football this morning. We're preaching the gospel. Praise God. We're going to be in Psalm chapter um, Psalm 91. I titled my message this morning, Just Trust Him. He's there even if you don't see Him. Amen? Amen. Just trust Him. He's there even if you don't see Him. Yes. Yes. Psalm chapter 91. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. And then we're going to talk about this psalm. Amen? Amen. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation or living place. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thee. Your dwelling. This psalm is a little bit different than a lot of psalms. Many psalms that we already know were written by King David. He's, he was known as the great psalmist. If you'll remember the story of King David, even as a young boy, a shepherd tending his father's sheep in the in the field. You know, he we we believe that he that is a time when he would have been playing his harp and writing many of the lyrics, or at least singing unto the Lord. That later would be be written down as psalms or songs. In other way to say it unto the Lord and, and that's where David gained great strength and I have to tell you it doesn't seem like a real manly thing I'm just going to be real with you it doesn't seem like a real manly thing to be sitting in a in a field with a bunch of soft sheep and sitting on the green grasses of rolling hills and strumming a harp and singing to, it doesn't come up but it but it and I didn't plan on saying all this but at the same time you got to get your mind in the right moment to really get a revelation of what we're talking about here. Hello. There might have been a soft side to this young man named David, but at the same time as he's strumming, a lion and a bear came to attack yeah. the sheep, yeah. and this young David oh, slew yeah. the lion and the bear, and that prepared him for whenever he faced that great giant Goliath, and I'm here to tell you, he was a warrior. He was a warrior by nature, right. and he won the battles that he faced because he understood how to fight, and the way that he was called to fight wasn't that he would stand up in his own strength, but that he found great power as he stood up in the strength of the Lord, as he walked for God and allowed God to put him forward in the battle and allowed God to use him as a vessel. I'm telling you, there's great power in all of that. I have found great power uh, you know, I always wanted to be strong. I'm just telling you the way that, you know, the way that my daddy tried to raise me. I always wanted to try to be strong in the physical. And i got to tell you something. Whenever the trials of life began to break me down and whenever I began to face some various things that caused a lot of pain in my life, I found myself broken and in a place where I can honestly say I was very weakened. Yes. And I had never faced something like that before. Oh, it had always been clouded. I had tried to use drugs, alcohol, chemicals, whatever, to make it go away, to make it fade away. But the reality of it was, was that none of that was working anymore. All of that was failing me. It was leaving me empty. And in that moment of time, the Lord drew me and said, seek me early and you will find me. And the next thing I know, he's teaching me how to worship him. And in those moments of time alone with God, worshiping God, with tear-filled eyes, with a broken heart, and crying out to him and telling him things like, 
I love you, Lord. You are beautiful to me. I have never experienced such love. What is this love that you have bestowed upon me? I don't even understand why you would do such a thing for a person like me. And in those moments of time, I'm telling you. Oh, Lord knows that I have faltered and failed and I've flopped along many a time since then. But I'm here to tell you, I found great strength in those moments. Hallelujah. I, I was creating, by the grace of God, psalms out of my own heart. Hallelujah. And he'll do that for you. And let me tell you something. If you're scared, Big Daddy, whoever you might be, to get up and to, to talk to your God in the morning and to allow from your broken heart to pour out to him, you, you may never find the strength that is awaiting you. I'm telling you, there's a strength that is awaiting you. I know I've told the story before about how I went to the altar at that old church that I used to go to because I was in the back and things were distracting me. And so I felt like, I was like, Lord, I can't even focus on you. He said, well, get up here and worship me up there like you do in your house, like you've been doing in your house in the living room in the morning at 4 o'clock. Put all that other stuff behind you and focus on me. Yeah. And I'll never forget it. I know I've told you all the story, but I'm going to keep telling you the story. Yeah. Because when I got up there, the, the, the enemies tried to speak to my ear. Mm -hmm. Because he had been speaking to my ear. And I was more accustomed to his voice than I was the voice of the Lord. And he said, there's people in this place that think you're weak. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the Lord came in and said, there are people in this place that think you're weak. But I'm making you stronger than they will ever know. I'm telling you, I got tapped into some power during those days of my life. Amen? Yes. Praise God. So I just want to encourage you to be like the psalmist David, even though we're not talking about one of his psalms this morning. I want to encourage you to be like the psalmist David. Amen? And to allow a song to be birthed in your heart. Yes. And like we were talking about last week, Jesus is our song. Amen? Amen. Sing about Jesus. Amen. Sing to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. But this psalm is different. This one was written by Moses. So we'll put it around the time of the Exodus. It could be understood to be a psalm of hope and encouragement for God's people as they were leaving Egyptian bondage and, and moving towards the promised land of Canaan that God had prepared for them. Amen? Amen. I try to imagine the mindset of the people of God as they begin this new season in their lives. I want you to try to put yourself in the midst of a situation like that. It would seem that they would be full of great joy and celebration. Amen? Amen. To be freed after 400 years of Egyptian slavery and despair, well, ready to move forward in life, trusting God every step of the way. But the reality is that there was probably a significant amount of uncertainty involved. Yeah. What were the mindsets that were developed over these years of slavery? Why are people happy to be released from prison? I'm talking about modern day, but also many times stressed about the days that lie ahead. Why are women in abusive relationships longing to be free from the torture and abuse they face, yet oftentimes refuse to make a move in the direction of freedom? Wow. Why do people live a lifetime on drugs and cling to them as though they were their hope when the reality is that their life is being completely destroyed day by day by the very thing that they will not or cannot let go of? Mm -hmm. In all these cases, people, in a sense, have their lives conditioned to a certain way of life. Slavery, imprisonment, abuse, drug use become the new norm. The way of life and any thought or attempt to move in a new direction brings with it a fear of the unknown, apprehension and uncertainty about what lies ahead. But this is the walk of faith. Learning the ways of God is something that doesn't happen overnight. There will be heartache and uncertainty and the enemy of your soul will throw everything that he has at you in an attempt to destroy you. Anything to make you stay stuck in the rut where you are. Yeah. It's hard to break yeah. from a previous way of life, mm -hmm. even if that life is harsh and painful. When it's all we know, there is a part of us that wants to cling to the familiar, but you can't stay in Egypt if you're going to have the freedom that you need to serve God. I want to just tell you as part of my introduction about this girl named Ruth. Amen. And the reason why is, is because she is around the time frame that this Psalm 91 would have 
actually it was used. I believe that Psalm 91 was used in Ruth's life. I'm not going to, I don't have time to read Ruth. I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis of Ruth's life. I believe that my personal opinion is that Psalm 91, a passage out of what we just read was spoken to Ruth to encourage her and to reveal to her that the decision that she had made in her life was the right decision. Amen. Ruth I got to tell you, it was during that time frame. See, whenever we leave Exodus, the next step when the children of Israel entered the land of Canaan is known as the Judges. I'm sure you've heard of that. It was about a 400-year period of the Judges before we enter the time frame of the Kings. During the time frame of the Judges, see, Psalm 91, again, was written to the children of Israel as they were leaving in the Exodus, about to enter the Promised Land. And in this word, God was letting them know the noisome pestilence, the plague, the, the arrow that flies by day, it will not come near your habitation. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'm here to be your refuge, your tower, your strength. I'm here to let you know that I am your protector protection and I am your provider and if you will trust me in this new land that you don't have a clue of what you're facing right, right. you wanted freedom from over here and you were probably shouting and jumping on the day that I released you yeah. whenever I put that plague on Egypt and they said here take our gold and get out of here but it wasn't a week right. later it wasn't a couple of days later that you were complaining at the bitter waters of Mara and all along for 40 years as you traveled in the wilderness Wilderness, you complained and you came against what it was I was doing in your life because you couldn't see. But I got to tell you something. I'm going to give you a word before you leave, a word that you can hold on to that's going to remind you. He that abides under the shadow yes. of the Almighty. Yes. Hallelujah. He's there with you even when you can't see him. Trust him because he wants to be there to get you through. And this was Ruth. Listen, the story of Ruth goes like this. There was a, there was a couple named... There was a woman named Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, there was a famine in the land of Bethlehem. Okay. Gaudi said this morning, the house of bread. Bethlehem means the house of bread, but there was a famine. There was no bread in Bethlehem. And so Elimelech makes a choice to leave in the journey to a foreign country. You know, sometimes you might face a famine. Sometimes you might face rough times in the midst of your Christianity. But God has not called you to leave the house of bread. Come on, Christian, wherever you are, whether you're watching my video, if God planted you in a place where there's good bread being baked and you're being fed by the word of God, God has not called you to get up and to uproot yourself and bring yourself to another location where you're going to star in the midst of a foreign land where the word of God does not flow the way that it's supposed to. Amen. But that's what he did. He made a choice. He got up and he left. And what ended up happening was his two sons married two foreign women. One of them was Ruth. The two boys died. The daddy Elimelech dies. Now it's just Ruth and I don't even remember her name. I didn't even go back and look. What's Orpah? Ruth and Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah. Ruth and Orpah, maybe, well, I ain't going to try to clown Oprah's mama, but, you know, maybe she just got them two word letters transposed. But anyway, not Oprah, Orpah. Ruth and Orpah married the two boys. The two boys are dead. Elimelech is dead. Now it's just Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. I can remember this from a long time ago. Orpah's name means gazelle. She turns and she runs. She runs back to her people. Ruth, though, clung to Naomi. She said, you're not leaving me. Because I don't know. See, you got to understand something. Whenever you grew up in the midst of the world, you didn't really know the ways of God. And Ruth had grown up in the midst of a Moabite country. The name of her country was Moab. And the God that they served was Chemosh. And Chemosh made the way that you worshiped him was you offered your children up in sacrifice to him. Whole different culture, whole different set of morals, completely different than the people of God. And I don't think Ruth really knew the God of Naomi, but she knew one thing. She didn't want what she previously had, and she was about to make a decision to move forward into something completely new. Amen. And she said, oh, no, I'm going with you, Naomi. Right, right. I don't know. Who. She said, your people are going to be my people, and your God is going to be my God. And I can tell you right now, Ruth didn't even know what she was talking about right there when she said that. Mm -hmm. And as time would have it, the famine was over. That's why Naomi was going back. But they still didn't have anything. I don't have time to get into all the story, but Naomi told her, 
listen, you can go out there and you can glean in the fields. Now, the word of God says this. It says, Ruth happed upon the field of Boaz. The word happed means providence. It's kind of like where we get the word happened. It just happened. But in reality, no, the hand of God made it happen. She ended up in the field of the very person that she needed to end up in. And we don't have time to get into all the implications. But let me just say this. <clears throat> as she's being blessed, as she's out there working in the field, gleaning from the leftovers of the harvest, Boaz comes to her at some point in the story. And he says to her, these are the words I wanted to talk to you about. In Psalm 91, this is what it says in Psalm 91. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall you trust. Right now I'm just talking about to, to you about the introduction. I'm trying to talk to you about the fact that you are the people of God and that you're on a journey. I'm trying to talk to you about the fact that you need to trust him. And even though you can't see him, he is right there with you all the way. Amen. And that if you will trust him, he will he, he will allow, give you a place to abide under the shadow of his wings. So Boaz, this powerful, rich landowner and Ruth in his field, and Boaz lets her know what's going on. She doesn't understand why all of these blessings have come upon her. She's got more barley than she knows what to do with. She can't even carry all this barley home. What is going on? And Boaz tells her and says unto her, It has fully been showed me all that you have done unto your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. And how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your nativity. Which you didn't know the word nativity means birth. The birthplace. You left your birthplace. And you are come to a people which you knew not heretofore. Didn't that sound like Christianity? Didn't that sound like you was born in one place like Adam and you were born amongst these people and you were born a sinner and then one day you heard the good news. Hey, there's bread in Bethlehem and, the, and, you, and you believed it in your heart and you said, I got to travel to that place because I got to get fed because what I've been getting fed isn't really feeding me. It's killing me. And you made a decision to go that way. Hallelujah. And it would begin to change your very life. Amen. He says, the Lord recompense your work and a full reward be given to you, to, given thee of the Lord God of Israel. Look at this. This is Ruth 2, 11 through 12. I'm, not, I'm just going to slow down because I want you to see it. I want you to see it. I believe Boaz is quoting Psalm 91 to her. Boaz, in the middle of this time frame of the judges, he has seen God work in his own life. He has seen God make him a powerful landowner. And he remembers the Psalm 91 of his forefathers and how they had to leave during the land of the Exodus. And he says it right here, under whose wings you are come to trust. You might not understand it right now, Ruth. You might not even be able to completely comprehend the God that you have chosen to serve. But I'm here to tell you, this is what happens to those that come under the wings of the God that this is what happens that to those who learn to trust the God of Israel God desires to be you know that there's a there, there's a motherly love a motherly aspect of the father amen, amen. any good father is going to have a little bit of that nurture in him right right God desires to be like a mother bird that cares for his children. I got scripture to back that up. Don't worry. <laughs> he has a motherly concern for his children that don't know how to care for themselves. He's asking us to trust him and to stay close to him where he can take care of us. But many times we don't want to stay close to the Lord. Instead, we would rather go our own way, even though that way has brought us far from God in the past. Look at Luke chapter 13, verse 34. This is Jesus speaking right here. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you which kill the prophets and stone them that are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen does gather her brood under her wings? And you would not. You would not come under the protection of of God. You would not bring yourself to submit and to surrender to the will and the ways of God. Instead, you refuse to come and you continue to go your own way. 
Well, Christian, I got to tell you, for you and I both this morning, that we're on a journey. We're leaving Egypt and Moab, which represent the world, and we're learning to live in a new place called Canaan. It's a place that God has prepared for us. It's a place of comfort and hope because he will be there to take care of us. But it's a place where our faith will be tested so that we can grow stronger and stronger in the faith. Amen? Amen. Are, you, are we okay with that? To know that he's going to test our faith. Yes. He's going to take care of us. He's going to protect us. He's going to provide a place of refuge for us. But I got to tell you something. If you're going to a church or you're listening to a preacher on TV that's telling you if you're going through things, then you're not, you don't have enough faith. I'm here to tell you he's a lying preacher because every man of, or woman of God of any significance has faith trial and tribulation yes. and has had to learn on their own Amen. Amen. that they, what they want to do is to serve God. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. And sometimes it's not easy. Amen. Sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's painful. And sometimes, come on, we yes. want to quit. Yes. We want to turn around and we want to go back. But I'm here to tell you that is not the answer. Amen. After we have tasted that the Lord is good Amen. to turn our back Amen. on the Lord. Lord, help us. Yes. Amen. Yes. Thank yes. you, Jesus. Yes. He wants to make us stronger and stronger in the faith. Why? So that we can be used by God. That's right. Look, Amen. go back to Ruth real quick. Ruth gave birth to Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. Jesse fathered King David. And from his lineage came Messiah, Jesus. God wants to use you and I, Christian, but he can't use Ruth and Moab, and he can't use Israel and Egypt. He's got to get Israel to Canaan so he can have a place for Ruth to go, so David can be born, so Messiah can come, so you can get saved, so we can learn to trust him, so others can hear about the good news of the God we serve. Hallelujah. He's got a big old plan. Amen. He's got a big old plan, and you're a part of it. That's right. Amen. You're a part of the body. Yes. No, it's time that we get a revelation of that. Jesus is the head, not the preacher. No, yes. don't put me up there. I don't want to be up there, buddy. <laughs> Jesus is the head of the church. Yes. You and I are the body. Amen. 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 We're functioning body parts yes. on the earth. When Jesus was incarnate, in other words, when he walked upon the earth in his flesh, and the Holy Spirit dwelt in him. He was God. He was the God man on earth. Amen. He walked geographically upon the earth. He said, come out of them and the devils listen. He said, rise from the dead. And, and, and they came back to life. He healed leprosy. He, he, he opened blinded eyes. He walked the earth. Amen. Physically and miracles happen today. You and I are those body parts. Hello. And the Holy Spirit lives in each and every one of you. If you are saved this morning, the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, dwells on the inside of you. And God wants to use you and I as vessels, the body of Christ, to function on the earth in a similar fashion the way that Jesus did. He wants you and I to go to the workplace. He wants you and I to go to Walmart and not duck and hide on the aisle from that person that you didn't want to talk to. Come on, Christian. He doesn't want you playing duck and hide. He wants you to just suck it up. Not the way my daddy said, but the way our father would say. Listen, sometimes ministry requires that we would serve other people. Amen. What, I'm the only one that's got to go through that? As the preacher, I'm the only one that's ever got to serve? No, that's not true. You are all called to serve. That's right. Amen. Brothers and sisters, every last one of you are the body of Christ. Every last one of you got to say, now we might all be at different levels of our walk. And that's okay. God wants to have patience with us. Amen. And we all have to have patience with one another. But we're all called to serve. We're all called to minister. We're all called to humble ourselves and to be poured out as a drink offering unto the Lord. Amen. He has called us to use our life. Listen, we're living for something bigger than ourselves today. Amen. We're living for something bigger than the temporary today. We're living for eternity. And it's not just about, you know, I'm just, tell, I'm just talking to you from my heart. I'm just sharing with you things that I used to think back in the day. Oh, man, I'm so glad that my sister got saved and she told me about Jesus. Man, and now I ain't got to go to hell. Okay, that worked for about 15 years. <laughs> but, but then after, you know, finally I get out of that little fog, the Lord's like, son, yeah, 
I saved you so you didn't have to go to hell. Yes, because I want you with me for all eternity. But the devil's been trying to hold you in chains of bondage. The devil's been trying to keep you in Egypt. The devil's been trying to make you go back to Moab. So you won't stand up and be used by me as a vessel where I can pour myself out of you and into other people. You see, the first thing the devil wants you to do is not believe the truth so that your soul will be condemned and go to hell. Right, yeah, right. And in the morning of prayer, one time the Lord said, first he wanted to just send your soul to hell. Then after you heard the gospel and you said yes to me and I came to live on the inside of you, you can't have your soul anymore. And now what he wants to do, hold you in shackles and chains and bondage so that you don't ever do anything for me. Right. So he sews your little lips closed mm -hmm. so that you don't feel worthy to speak of me. That's not God's will for your life. Right. It's not God's will for you to stay in Moab or to stay in Egypt and have your lips sewn shut so that you can't speak for the things right. of God. That's not God's will. Lord, make us servants for you. Let us teach us to live for something bigger than ourselves. That's good preaching right there. You might not hear that down the road. I don't know what you're going to hear down the road. And I don't even have time to worry about what you're going to hear down the road. But I'm here to tell you, if you come to this church, you're going to hear. No, you were called, hallelujah, to be a vessel that the Holy Ghost will live in you and pour out of you and tell others the good news about him. Hallelujah. About him. He's worthy to be exalted. Thank you, Jesus. So here we go. Two things, just two, to take with you today as you embark on this new life and journey with God. Number one, a safe place of faith. A safe place of faith. Amen. A secret place. Verse one of, 90, of Psalm 91 says it. It says, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Yes. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Yes. You know, when someone dwells in a place, it means that they live there. Yeah. Amen? And we can see a physical dwelling with our eyes, right? I mean, we can drive down the road. We see physical dwellings on both sides of the road. Some of them are big and nice and monstrous. And we think to ourselves, wow, I bet you it's pretty up in that house. Some of them are a little bit more small and quaint. Nevertheless, they're physical dwellings where people live. But we're not talking about physical dwelling. Right. Yeah, in a sense, it is, but it's a spiritual dwelling. The reason I say in a sense, because you literally are dwelling yeah. somewhere. Yeah. You might not be able to see it. You might not be able to drive, but I'm here to tell you this morning, if you don't get nothing else out of my message, you need to understand there is a spiritual dwelling place yeah. and you and I can tap into that and you and I can choose to live in that place and we got to live in that place by faith and trust and if we, daily we will learn to live in that place by faith and trust, grace will flow, the presence of the Holy Spirit will flow and he will protect us and guide us and lead us, amen, and he will teach us his ways. Amen. This is a horrible illustration, but I'm going to use it anyway. You ready? I'm not promoting this. I'm using it as an illustration. Back when I was growing up, there was a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Anybody heard of that? Look, I'm not promoting Dungeons and Dragons. I'm sure there were some people that played this goofy game and they did fine with it. But there were other people that got so knee deep in this game that it created an alternate reality for them. It created an alternate reality for them, and they literally began to live in this place. It was a place of darkness. It was a place of made-up figments of their imagination. It was a place of characters. But they literally began to live their life out in this game called Dungeons & Dragons. They began right, to right. believe that they were literally in the game. Horrible illustration, but the point that I want to try to make to you is this. Is that when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ... Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit took you from this world that you were born into that was sin stricken, sin sickened. Amen. And he baptized you into the person of Christ, into the Holy One of Israel. He put you in him. And in God's mind, you died with him at Calvary. Yes. This is Romans yes. chapter yes. six. You yes. died with him. You were buried with him. And even as Jesus was raised from the dead, you too are supposed to. Hear me now. You too are supposed to walk in newness of life. You had a 
You had a, a position change. You had a place change. You were moved from one realm into another realm. You've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And as you walk upon this earth, do you have a new alternate reality. It just is what it is. Right. You might not be able to say, I'm talking about the secret place this morning. Right. I'm talking about dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. How do you get there? You get there by faith. Faith in what? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because I am the door to the sheep. Because it was my flesh that was ripped. The veil that prevented you from getting in has now been moved out of the way and you can now enter into my presence and in this place, hallelujah, there there's grace in this place. The spirit of God is moving and operating in your life. That's and he's right. changing you. Yes. He's changing your mindsets. He's changing your thoughts. He's changing everything on the inside That's of you right. as you're surrendering to him. Hallelujah. Each and every day. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God is a reality that is present on the earth. The fall of man resulted in sin and sin drives the presence of God away from man However, God's plan is to bring his presence back to man closer and closer until one day his literal presence will be on earth with man. Yes. Revelation Hallelujah. chapter 21 verses 1 through Praise 3. God. Isn't that glorious? Yes. I mean, what a glorious thought. We're talking about the secret place of the most high. See, right now it's a secret place because not everybody can see it. They don't see you carrying your house around with you. <laughs> oh, no, that ain't where I live. You don't want to come look at my house on 525 Hill. I still got wood on the windows. That's not where I live. When the world did call, by the way, though, it's coming. Right. It's all coming. Okay, but listen, that's not where you really live. No, I live in another place. You want to come live where I live? You want to come to my neighborhood? Because I live in a whole different place. Most people look at that neighborhood and they don't have nothing to do with it. But I got good news for you. That's the place you want to live. Revelation 21, 1 through 3. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. It, listen, there's so much theology behind this. The Feast of Tabernacles of Leviticus chapter 23, finding its fulfillment in this, I believe, this New Testament passage that the whole idea is that Israel was a wandering people, but that one day there's going to be a rest. Rest was first pr proven and provided when Jesus Christ showed up and when we put faith in him and we learn to abide in him. We get great rest out of him because he is the true fulfillment of the Sabbath. He is the rest day. It's not just about you coming to church on a Sunday or the Jews going to the synagogue on a Saturday. No, Jesus is the Sabbath. Jesus is the rest. But one day that's going to be fulfilled whenever Jesus and the Father. Hallelujah. Look what it says. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And until that day, I'm here to tell you that there's a secret place. There's a secret place. And he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And he will protect you. And he will heal you. And he will encourage you. Amen. Amen. He will change you yes. if you will trust him. I talked about it Wednesday night, but God told Moses to build him a place where he could live with his people. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. It says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. A sanctuary literally means a hallowed or a holy place. The result of what Moses made was a tabernacle or a tent. And beyond that veil was an inner room called the Holy of Holies. And in that room, the presence of God dwelt between the cherubim upon the mercy seat. And once a year, the high priest went back there like we talked about and would sprinkle blood. All a type of Jesus preparing the way for us back into the presence of God. Through the years, God's presence dwelt with Israel within the Holy of Holies until Jesus became flesh and dwelt on earth. Look at John chapter 1, verse 14. <clears throat> it says the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. Because that's what it means in the Greek. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. Je the presence of God showed up in Jesus' person. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus became us 
so he could dwell amongst us. Right. He brought the presence of God with him to earth. And when he died and paid the penalty of sin, faith creates a transference where our guilt was attributed to him on the cross and his righteousness was given to us as a gift. And now we become a new sanctuary where the presence of God dwells in us on earth until the day when he will physically and literally dwell with us on earth. Look at this. First Corinthians 3.16. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says this, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Hallelujah. You're, it's no longer in a, in a tent in the, in the wilderness. It's no longer just in Jesus on earth. But now you have become the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Hallelujah. You don't hide a light under a bushel. The presence of God lives on the inside of you. You are a vessel. You are a traveling tent upon this earth. Carrying the very presence of God with you. Everywhere that you go. Hang in there with me. Because I'm just trying to paint you a picture for a place of faith. A secret dwelling place. That we can enter into and continue to live in by faith. It's a place where we are one with God, a place where his spirit is with us as we journey life on this earth. It's a place of faith. You're going to have to believe it, but I don't get it, preacher. I want to, I want a formula, man. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me what I can do to inherit eternal life. Jesus said this, do the, the work of the father, work of faith. That's right. And that's what it requires, the work of faith. It's a spiritual realm that you can live in while on this earth. A place where the Spirit of God living in you and will guide you in the direction they would have you to go if you will listen. But in order to listen, you have to be able to hear His voice. That's right. Let me say that again because I use a lot of words. In order to listen, you're going to have to be able to hear His voice. In order to listen, you're going to have to be able to hear His voice. Voice. In order to listen, you're going to have to be able to hear his voice. How do you hear his voice? Who speaks for God? The Holy Spirit. Right, right. The Holy Spirit speaks for God. You know what language he speaks? He speaks only one language. Yeah. The Holy Spirit speaks only one language, church. He speaks the language of the word of God. Yeah. This is the language that he speaks. And if you're not fluent in this language, right, right. then you're going to have a hard time with the translation. Right. I'm talking about you living in the midst of a world that's speaking world language and you're going to have a hard time with this translation. Sometimes it's still, a I'm not trying to pick on him, but in case you don't try to fall asleep on me, I want to make sure. Gowdy, when Gowdy gets up and talks, sometimes I still have a little bit of trouble understanding him. Not a lot. I've gotten to know him quite well. But I'm just trying to say that there's almost like I'm in the middle of two different languages. Sometimes in our walk with God, when we're not fluent in this language right here, right. it becomes difficult for us to understand because everything becomes muddled and foggy because of the communication that we're receiving from the world. Right. But the better that we learn this language, the easier it is for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And we hear the word of God speaking to our heart. What I'm trying to tell you is, Christian, ain't no way out of this. Hallelujah. You need to get in this book. You need to do some homework in this book. You need to find you a preacher that you can listen to that will teach about this book. And you need to grow up in the things of Christ. Yes. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Lord. Yes. God did all that to provide you with a secret of safety where you could live on earth. A place where you could live on earth if you choose to live in that place. Under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. He is our refuge. Listen, one more thing I want to talk to you real quick before we shift gears is a place of refuge. A place of refuge is hope. It's trust. It's shelter from a storm. A stormy sea can be scary, right? Yeah. Have you ever been on a stormy sea? Yeah. I have. But it can be a very scary place. But you can see a cove of protection up ahead. There's a lighthouse that shows the way. And if I can just get there, I know I will be okay. And when I do, I don't ever want to leave that place of safety again. Now, you know, sometimes we forget. Right? Sometimes we forget how bad the sea was. Yeah. Well, that was a long time ago, that storm. I forgot that storm. 
boy, I can't remember when I was in that storm, though. Ooh, man, I was like, Lord, please just get me to that lighthouse over there. Get me around that other side of them rocks right there. Put me in that cove of safety. Put me in that refuge, that shelter from the storm. And then I get over there and I live there for a while and how easily I forget. I start finding myself kind of drifting off. Lord, no, don't let me drift off. Hold me tight to you, Lord, is my prayer. Don't let me drift off. The good news is that you don't have to drift off. Amen. You don't have to leave that place of safety. You can choose to live by faith in the secret place of safety if you want. Or you can go back outside under the radiation of that harsh sun. I was thinking about that. To abide under the shadow of the Almighty. A shadow provides safety from the rays of the sun. Right. I mean, it's one thing to get out there and get a little vitamin D, but if you stuck out there and you can't get no shadow of safety, it's going to start to blister your skin. It's going to start to tear you up. It's going to start to bring destruction to your life. But hallelujah, he provides a place of safety and a shadow from the radiation of the sun or be tossed on the waves of an angry sea, that violent ocean. But the choice is ours. We don't have to leave the safety and the refuge of God. Amen? Amen. Point number two. This one isn't as long. Deliverance. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. You know, I've told this, I've preached this multiple times, actually, but I've told this story that I used to. A, a, a fowler was a person that caught birds. Okay, that was what he did for a living. He caught birds. And I remember being a kid, and I thought about bringing something today, and I forgot to do it, but I used to get a box. I didn't, you know, I remember me telling you that story. I used to get a box, and I would prop a stick up under it, and I'd tie a string to the bottom of the stick, and I'd try to put some bait over there to get the bird to walk up under the box, and then I'd yank the stick. And I, and I never really got that good at it, cause, but I learned as time went by, I finally caught one pigeon in the park one day, but just to see if it was all just about saying, I had a friend in Lafayette, that dude just straight up run up on a rabbit and snatch it up by the neck. That dude was, uh, he was a beast, but anyway, I couldn't even catch a bird with a box. But I realized through the course of time that sometimes I put too much bait outside and by the time the pigeon made it to the hole and he was all fat and he couldn't even fly no way. He's like, I won't go up under there. And then one time I got smart enough and, you know, basically I caught the pigeon and I let the thing go. I just wanted to see if the box thing would work. That's just a type for you to understand what a fowler was. He had some kind of trap system where he would bait it and he would catch birds. In this Psalm, the Lord is preparing the children of Israel. You got to understand something that when you head outside of Egypt and you head towards Canaan, there's a fowler out there and he's going to try to set traps for you. He's going to try to bait you and set traps for you. But I'm here to tell you that I will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. There's going to be times in your Christian walk where you might find yourself feeling as though you're snared by the fowler. Yep. You know, yep. Sierra's dog, Tiki, I love that dog. I never thought I'd love a dog. I play with that dog all the time. She's got these little things, and she's a pit bull, and I'll just be sitting there laying on the on the floor watching the news or something like that, and she'll come bring the thing to me. She'll get all up in my face. <laughs> time to play, dude. So I'm like, okay, so I'll just lay there, and, she, and she will get, she'll get down on it. You know what I'm saying? She'll be like, and she's like ripping her body from side to side, and I'm just sitting there holding it, watching TV. <laughs> And then whenever I get, whenever I kind of get, get tired, she'll, and I'm like, no, I'm not playing anymore. She'll take her paw and she's like, <laughs> like, and she's right. And I'm thinking, dude, when I'm 80, this ain't going to work because my skin is going to be all jacked. <laughs> so, but what I do is, is that when she does that, I'll reach over there and I'll snatch her paw and I'll just hold on to it. And she's like, I'm stuck. She got that thing in her mouth. I got she got my, I got her paw in my hand, and she don't know what to do. And I'm like, Yeah, you stuck, dude. The, the fowler that got you in the snare, boo. And I just sit there, keep watching TV. Next thing you know, she'll drop the thing, and she'll like try to like nibble on my hand. She doesn't bite. She'll nibble on my hand to try to say like, Let go. But then I will keep grabbing that grabbing that arm. I just thought about that. Like yeah. that's what happens. We're just we're just moving about our daily life, and the next thing you know, the fowler he yeah. said some bait. And he done tried to lure us into the trap. Now, I got this little idea that I want to share with you so that you can maybe better see it. Brother Larson used to talk about the sin pond. Okay, this is a little bit different, but let's just imagine that these are all the fish. And I know that this is usually the sign of Christians, but we're just going to imagine that all these fish are swimming towards the, white, the wide gate. 
right? Remember the one that leads to destruction. Right, right. And then there's this one, and this one here, he represents the Christian that's going in the opposite direction. Mm. But do you think for one second that the fowler is going to let you, who do you think you are, Christian? Right. Do you think he's going to let you keep swimming in the opposite direction whenever he knows good and well he used to have you right where he wanted you? According to Ephesians chapter 2, I think it's verse 2, it talks about the fact that all of us used to walk the course of the world. Yeah. Where the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, is causing the children of disobedience to move in a certain direction. They're all moving in a direction towards the enemy. So we're going to draw a little picture of him. He's the goat. That's what he. That's what that is. He's the goat. But the goat has. I'm not gonna. That's that's just him right there. But the goat has a fishing pole, right? And he's an angler, and he's got some kind of bait down here. I don't know what that bait is. What is your bait? Mm, right, right. What is what is your bait? What is it that he can right. throw right here, and you're like. Oh, man, and I don't know nothing about fishing. I really don't, but I've done watch some people on TV before. <laughs> and they'll throw that bait over there, and then what they'll do is they'll kind of, kind of tug it back. So that bait's coming right back across here, and he's like, hmm, I think I might come back this way. Mm. Let me come back this way because that bait looks good. It looks tasty, and it smells good. I want some more of that, right? And I don't know what your bait is. Right, right. But nevertheless, whatever that bait might be, I'm telling you right now, that's the snare of the fowl. He's trying to pull you back in the wrong direction. He's trying to get you to step outside of God's will. And whenever you step outside of God's will, you're no longer dwelling and, and abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. You're, you're removing yourself from the protection and the grace of God. You know, Brother Larson used to say, he'll keep changing bait. Yes. He'll keep, he got a tackle box. Let's draw him a tackle box. <laughs> He got a tackle box of, 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 of bait. And he'll just keep on changing it out until he finds the right one. You're like, oh, that one don't work no more. Y'all, you lying devil. You ain't going to get me to open that can of dip and stick that junk in my lip no more. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got victory over that one. Smoking? Dude, no way. Right? Did I smoke? You better believe it. I don't want nothing to do with that. I'm, just, I'm, I'm not picking on people that smoke. I'm just telling you. I don't want none of that. Don't want to be addicted to nicotine. Don't want to be uh, d desiring to drink. Don't want to smoke no weed no more. Don't want to do none of that stuff. Yeah. But that don't mean that he ain't going to keep changing bait. That doesn't mean he's not going to keep on trying. That doesn't mean he's not going to keep on throwing stuff in that direction to try to pull you in the, in, off the path. Yep. Yep. Lord, help us. Yes. Yes. Lord, help. Awesome. He sits back on the bank. And he attempts to lure one fish to change directions and move back towards him. And he doesn't care about all the others right now because they're already going in the wrong direction. Right. And all these fish have a bait that will attract them. Right. They're all swimming after something. Some are swimming after addictions, drugs, alcohol, some relationships, some happiness, some power, education, prosperity. And he keeps on trying with different baits until he finds the right one to get this one fish to change directions and come back towards him. You know, many times it's not even just addictions and sins that you can see. Sometimes it's just a mindset. Yes. yes. Right. Or sometimes the Lord will just, I mean, the, the Lord will allow it because the Lord's allowing it all to happen. But the enemy will try to throw some other kind of bait on there. Man, I done tried every sin of lust that I knew I could throw on this person. And they understand that message of the cross. I just wish that I could have prevented them from ever hearing that message because you're starting to get on my nerves. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, you know what they do? They cause someone close to you to do something that frustrates you. And it's not even a sin of lust, but it frustrates you so bad. It gets you so aggravated that the next thing you know, a spirit of bitterness tries to take root in your heart. You're like, you know what? I ain't going to keep going in that direction. I'm going to veer off a little bit. And the next thing you know, it might have taken a whole lot longer. It wasn't as quick of a turn. But you, you, know, you done found yourself going back in the wrong direction. I don't know what it is. But he will not quit. And there's all kind of don't make me spell it out, Christian. There's all kind of tactics. There's all kind of lures. There's all kind of bait that he will use to try to get you to change direction. Lord, help us. Many times people feel trapped in their situations and feel as though there's no way out, but that's not what God says.